it's a pop blessed service. You are asked to cook something, bring something, and most of all, bring someone for this very special night. The youth and the Sunday school teachers and the uh, Sunday school children are doing a presentation on that very night as well. All right. So, praise the Lord and uh, continue to pray for Sister Rita. Okay, amen. So let's give our offerings. Bless every cheerful giver tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we as this evening we pray. Amen. Oh, Catherine, you cannot use your handphone to translate, can I? Your demo, okay, no. <laughs> So do continue to pray for Rita, okay? And we welcome again you all to the house of God. Let's turn to Second Kings chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5. And um, <clears throat> so Second Kings 5 was 1 to us uh, 15. And uh, in this chapter, uh, there is in this story here, uh, it is a wonderful story and uh, a story of um, what you call that breakthrough, a story of uh, answer prayers, a story of um, God meeting with uh, humanity and God begin to um, uh, answer or God begin to uh, bring something that is um, what you call not normal to become normal. Okay. And in this chapter, there is a particular someone that that helps to kind of bring this change to to a particular someone. And maybe that person is you. You are that particular someone who needs God to help you. You need a miracle from God. And you need God to begin to powerfully move in your life and change the course of your life and transform your life. And in this story of this man receiving that, that particular something that he longs for, okay, there is what you call a particular someone as well that brought about that change. This person, particular someone, does not have a name. To, okay, but without this person, the story, this story here may not be here. This story here may not be, you know, found worded in Second Kings chapter five, okay. And this story here of this particular someone is who have does not have a name uh, is what you call that uh, an important person in our life. And this is to tell us tonight that we should never despise anyone. Okay? We should never look down on anybody because that particular person may be the person that may help bring a change to your situation. The Bible has a mix of very famous people and also a mix of people that you may never know their name, but maybe one day in heaven, when you see them, you will know their name, okay? There is an English term called unsung heroes, which means heroes that you never know that they are heroes, but without them, the hero cannot be a hero. There is this race that's held every year in France, and it's called the Tour de France. A very crueling 
tiring race and they race for like I think 21 days and they cycle up and down around hills and on a daily basis they race like 20 over miles per day and only on the 21 or 23rd day um, there will be a winner but each of the winner that wins they don't win alone there's a group behind that winner that helps to make that winner a winner this group of racers you will never know them you know then they will never step up onto the podium they will never have a a goal um, you know a goal medal on their neck they will just be among the people and you do not know that without these people unsung heroes without name this hero will not be wearing the gold medal now tonight i want to look at such a person the bible here does not give us to us a name the bible just says she is a little maid a captive out from the land of israel a little maid and she waited on naaman's wife okay she is a servant and she served the, the wife of general naaman general naaman here at this moment of time he has a problem this problem that he has is is a problem that is something that is disdained by society society does not welcome this kind of problem that this man have i believe only a few people know about this problem maybe his wife and probably no one else know he hides it okay he hides that problem he he keeps it close in his heart and and when this servant girl was in the house, the servant girl began to notice that this general, this great general, he has this problem. And what happened is that this little maid out from Israel who is a captive, uh, a prisoner, when she noticed the problem that Naaman has, he began to tell his wife, you know, there is a man of God from Israel. His name is Elisha. He can solve your problem. So when he began to act upon it, he went to see this man, Elisha. The Bible tells us that it was number 14 that this problem that was um, uh, staining his life was soft the bible tells us in verse 14 then he went down and deep himself seven times in the jordan according to the saying of the man of god his flesh came again like unto a flesh of a child and he was clean this man has leprosy okay and imagine uh, that day the joy that he must have felt health is wealth and this is so true for him so true that for him especially being someone who's uh, high in position and immense joy immense joy to his entire family as well to himself is now free okay? it is always great joy if you're bound by certain things and it looks like there's no answer to it but an answer comes or came and this brings immense joy verse one says to us he is a successful commander of the syrian army okay. honorable to his master in his eyes in the master's eyes this is Top notch. This is number one. This man is a is a is a really um, really great man. 
He's a mighty man of valor. But in his life, there's a but. Maybe as you're sitting here, you know, everything is going through. And you have everything, but there's a but there. And this but is disturbing you. The Bible says in verse 1, he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. But also, if not for this young, captive, nameless girl from the land of Israel, um, this but a leper will go down with him to his grave, if not for this um, nameless girl from the land of Israel. Again, you never know how God uses uh, use the method God used to answer your prayer. Never despise anybody. Okay, Never look down on anybody. You never know that person may be the person. So this evening, I would like to examine with you this nameless or unsung hero in which the Bible is filled of many of these and we're going to look at this one of them right now here in 2 Kings 5 and firstly the lesson that we learn from this it is alright this evening to be nameless fameless knownless it is all right that you don't have a name or a title or it's all right that no one knows who you are it's all right that you're not recognized or maybe it's all right that in the eyes of many you are invisible no nobody will ever know your name and i believe that those names that appear in the Bible from names such as Abraham and, and David and Joseph, if they have it their way, they would like to be also nameless if they can. In fact, there are a number of nameless names in the Bible that without them, the Bible stories would not have ended the way God wants it to end. But because of such or because of them, we find that there's a story for them. There's the nameless wife of Noah. There is the names, there's the nameless names of the daughters of Pharaoh who saw baby Moses in this in this little wheat kind of small little boat floating down this the water. The nameless names of the wise men the canaanite woman who seek help from jesus for his daughter the thief on the cross okay who rebuked the other thief and he humbly asked jesus remember me when you come into thy kingdom their names were nameless never mentioned but though not mentioned without them the storyline of the Bible will not be complete. So this evening, if you feel you are invisible, you feel like, you know, it's like nameless, does not really matter. What really matters is you are known by God. God knows you. Okay. And for this woman, this little maid, and when I get to heaven, I want to meet this young Jewish girl. Okay. In fact, this is the actual mark of Christ himself. When Paul spoke of Jesus saying in the book of Philippians, he made himself of no reputation. When I see someone having a lot of titles, okay, reverend, doctor, this and this, I get scared. Okay. I'm like, oh boy, you know, I'm, I'm really scared of people that have a lot of titles to their name. Okay. 
Jesus make himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant, making the likeness of men. The second lesson tonight from this story is he who is the greatest is he or she who serves. She was a captive Jewish girl, forced from, taken out forcefully from her own land, okay, and now brought to Syria to be a servant. And she was placed into a house of this general who is have a lepro leprosy to serve the wife of this man. Servants again has no name. Servants has no rights. Servants has no life of their own. They are servants. And their life is a life of servanthood. Their life is to serve. Just like this captured girl from Israel who is now in the house of the Syrian general. Though everyone likes to be served, okay, but between the two, to serve is greater to be served. Okay, for this was exactly where God wanted her to be. This was exactly God wants her life occupation to be, that is to be a servant. And this is what God wants your life to be. That is to be, a, to be someone who has a servant's heart. Now, here we find that in the eyes of God, She's not just a servant of to Naaman's wife, but she was a servant of God. God is all over the Bible. And for every servant who serve, they are not just a servant girl or servant man, but a servant of the Most High God, doing God's bidding. In verse number three, she began to testify to this general about the prophet Elisha. That is, if he goes and see him, God will heal him. And true enough, he did get healed. Okay. Elisha, name means God is my salvation. Elisha, that name He's a type of Jesus. The name Jesus is the one who saved God the salvation. God our salvation. Elisha is the type of Jesus Christ. And we find him or we find her in the house of this man, of this general, being a servant. And in that servanthood, she begins to serve the wife of this Naaman's wife. And in that, she begins to, uh, begins to testify about the prophet Elisha. Now, another lesson we need to learn from this nameless hero is about the power of an open mouth. Here she begins to testify about Jesus or Elisha. She says to the mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. The greatest tool of a servant, of a believer, is the tool of introduction, is the tool of our mouth. She said to her mistress, and then after that, the wife of this sick man told it to him, and Naaman went, and Naaman told it to his master. Okay. The, next, the next thing began to happen is that uh, we find him uh, getting healed and getting cleansed. If she had not opened her mouth, 
God would not have got the glory. He would not have been healed. Again, the words of our mouth, that is the word of introduction, the word of pointing people to Jesus, the word of testifying about Christ who is able to do the impossible, to heal, is so powerful. One of the things that the enemy will try to threaten you and I okay, is to threaten you and I to talk about Jesus Christ. To try to shut your mouth, to say nothing about Christ. Even though she is in a captivity situation, her own freedom has been taken away. She's forced into doing something. She's taken into a home, not her own even though she is uh, in a situation that is not to her liking. But nevertheless, it did not stop her from opening up her mouth and introducing to this couple about a man called Elisha that can heal um, the man. This teaches tonight that you and I need to be always, when you hear need, when you hear something that somebody is in trouble, point them to Jesus. Tell them to go to Jesus. Tell them to call upon Jesus. Tell them to reach out to Jesus because he's the answer to their problems. Now, in this 2 Kings chapter 5, there's one main lesson that we all need to learn, and this is a very important lesson that God looks for. And there is the importance of humility. Humility to God is a big thing. Okay? Humility when there's humbleness before God, God is attracted by a heart that is humble. That is heart that is full of humility. We find here that as the story goes here that when this man general was pointed to Elisha, he went to see Elisha. Okay. In verse number 9, the Bible says Elisha came with his horses and with his chariot and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Elisha. And instead, Elisha, instead of coming out to see him, Elisha sent a messenger. And the messenger says to this man, who is a general, who is, who is you know, used to the upper life, the high life. And Elisha didn't even come out. Elisha sent the messenger, go, wash yourself, in the river Jordan seven times and your flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. So when he approached Elisha's house, the answer to his problem, Elisha, instead of coming out, sent a messenger and the messenger says, go and wash seven times. Your flesh shall come again to thee. But in verse 11, Instead of responding to that, to that, uh, to that request, go. Naaman became very angry, and Naaman began to, you know what, uh, begin to say to himself, "I thought he would surely come out to me." There is this self-importance in him, thinking that you know what, that I am in top, I am above, and. And I come to see him on the way, and, and since I'm someone high and mighty, he will surely come out to meet me, and surely stand before me, and he will call upon the name of the Lord, and he will strike his hands upon me, or over me, and I shall be healed. But instead, he asked him to go and dip himself in the river Jordan, and he didn't even come out himself. Sometimes, you know, God... He works in ways such as this. He sent people 
around us to see what is in our heart. Okay. And the Bible says Naaman was very angry and he went away. And he began to say, you know what, River Jordan, are there not better rivers, cleaner rivers than the River Jordan? You send me to a dirty river? He turned away in rage, in anger. Thank God for his servants. The servants came to him in verse 13. And they say to him, you know what? If this man of God asks you to do something great, if he asks of you to climb the Mount Everest to get healed, you would climb it. But he asks you to do a simple thing. He asks you to go down to the river Jordan. What he's saying is, Elisha is asking him to humble himself. Humble himself. The Bible says, God resists the proud, but the humble, those who do not think highly of themselves, though they may be high, they may be rich, they may be powerful, they may be capable, but they do not think themselves, you know, highly because of their capableness and their wealth and their richness. They have a heart that still goes down, a heart that still would dip themselves in the Jordan River. They do not mind it. They don't call things dirty or unclean. Okay. The servant says, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather when he say to you, wash and be clean? Finally, in verse 14, he humbled himself. This tells us many times when pride comes to try to attack us, to try to tell you and I, you know, you are such a great person and such a, a able person. You are better than this person. You know, look at that person. That person is not good as you. This tells us that this evening when such a thought comes your way, the Bible tells us that we need to put those things aside, resist those spirit of pride. The Bible tells us, verse 14, he went down. Okay? He accepted the words the messenger brought to him. He listened. Okay. He listened He listened to the uh, captive little maid, and now he listened to his servants when they came. He has this pride, but he was able to listen, and when he listened, he put away that pride, and he went down, the Bible says, and he dipped himself seven times in Jordan. The Bible says, verse 14, his flesh came again, he was healed, he was set free. And the Bible says, verse 15, he went back to the man of God, and he stood before him, and he begins to say, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. And this evening, this whole story here, at the end of the day, is teaching about you and I, okay, uh, the importance of a heart that is humble before him. Amen. One every head bow. I want you to stand to your feet. Uh, we want to take communion tonight. And for those who are not here in the morning, Jesus shed his blood 2,000 years ago. Jasper? On Calvary's cross, he took on a form of humanity, making himself of no reputation.
King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Mighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. So many things He created. Last week we were in Sipang and we caught a fish. It's out of this world, that fish. Small fish, but it's so unique, so different, so special. Only God can do that. Okay. He got a horn on top of his neck that's like two inches. Horns by both the side of his body. The fish, one of them can become like a balloon. When you catch it out, it and it becomes it becomes it's just it's, this is your creator who make all this it's just a small thing you go to the grasses you find insects you dig under the earth you find worm you find all kinds of things so many things our creator yet he humble himself form you and I father in heaven we thank you for your love for us. You send us Jesus to die for us on the cross. We remember that day tonight. You call us to do this in remembrance of you. And we want to remember that day when he loved us and gave himself for us. As we take up the bread and drink of the cup, Lord, we pray, God, your grace and mercy will always go with us. Thank you. We come with a thankful heart, thanking for what you have done for us through Christ Jesus. As we break the bread in two, symbolizes the broken body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's break the bread. Let's eat of the bread. A string of the cup. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you have any prayer requests, I will pray for you tonight. Amen.